Prince Caspian, Chapter 14 How All Were Very Busy A little before two o'clock, Trumpkin and the Badger sat with the rest of the creatures at the wood's edge, looking across at the gleaming line of Miraz's army, which was about two arrow shots away. In between, a square space of level grass had been staked for the combat. At the two far corners stood Glozel and Sospespian with drawn swords. At the near corners were giant Wimbleweather and the bulgy bear, who in spite of all their warnings, was sucking his paws and looking to tell the truth uncommonly silly. To make up for this, Glenstorm, on the right of the list, stock still, except when he stamped a hind hoof occasionally on the turf, looked much more imposing than the telemarine baron who faced him on the left. Peter had just shaken hands with Edmund and the doctor and was now walking down to the combat. It was like the moment before the pistol goes at an important race, but very much worse. I wish Aslan had turned up before it came to this, said Trumpkin. So do I, said Truffle Hunter, but look behind you. Crows and crockery, muttered the dwarf as soon as he had done so. What are they? Huge people, beautiful people, like gods and goddesses and giants. Hundreds and thousands of them closing in behind us. What are they? It's the Dryads and Hamadryads and Sylvans, said Truffle Hunter. Aslan has waked them. Humph, said the dwarf. That'll be very useful if the enemy try any treachery. But it won't help the High King very much if Miraz proves handier with his sword. The badger said nothing, for now Peter and Miraz were entering the list from opposite ends, both on foot, both in chain shirts with helmets and shields. They advanced until they were close together. Both bowed and seemed to speak, but it was impossible to hear what they said. Next moment, the two swords flashed in the sunlight. For a second, the clash could be heard, but it was immediately drowned because both armies began shouting like crowds at a football match. Well done, Peter. Oh, well done, shouted Asman as he saw Miraz reel back a whole pace and a half. Followed up quicks, and Peter did. For a few seconds, it looked as if the fight might be won. But then Miraz pulled himself together, began to make real use of his height and weight. Miraz, Miraz, the king, the king, came the roar of the telemarines. Caspian and Edmund grew white with sickening anxiety. Peter is taking some dreadful knocks, said Edmund. Hallo, said Caspian. What's happening now? Both falling apart, said Edmund. A bit blown, I expect. Watch. Ah, now they're beginning again, more scientifically this time, circling round and round, feeling each other's defenses. I'm afraid this Miraz knows his work, muttered the doctor, but hardly had he said this, when there was such a clapping and baying and throwing up of hoods among the old Narnians that it was nearly deafening. What was that? What was that? asked the doctor. My old eyes missed it. The high king has pricked him in the armpit, said Caspian, still clapping, just where the armhole of the hauberk let the point through. First blood. It's looking ugly again now, though, said Edmund. Peter's not using his shield properly. He must be hurt in the left arm. It was only too true. Everyone could see Peter's shield hung limp. The shouting of the telemarines redoubled. You've seen more battles than I, said Caspian. Is there any chance now? Precious little, said Edmund. I suppose he might just do it with luck. Oh, why did we let it all happen, said Caspian. Suddenly, all the shouting on both sides died. Edmund was puzzled for a moment. Then he said, oh, I see. They both agreed to a rest. Come on, doctor. You and I may be able to do something for the High King. They ran down to the lists, and Peter came outside the ropes to meet them, his face red and sweaty, his chest heaving. Is your left arm wounded? asked Edmund. It's not exactly a wound, said Peter. 
I got the full weight of his shoulder on my shield, like a load of bricks, and the rim of the shield drove into my wrist. I don't think it's broken, but it might be a sprain. If you could tie it up very tight, I think I could manage. While they were doing this, Edmund asked anxiously, What do you think of him, Peter? Tough, said Peter, very tough. I have a chance if I can keep him on the hop till his weight and short wind come against him, and this hot sun, too. To tell the truth, I haven't much chance else. Give my love, too, to everyone at home, Ed, if he gets me. Here he comes into the lists again. So long, old chap. Goodbye, doctor. And I say, Ed, say something especially nice to Trumpkin. He's been a brick. Edmund couldn't speak. He walked back with the doctor to his own lines with a sick feeling in his stomach. But the new bout went well. Peter now seemed to be able to make some use of his shield, and he certainly made good use of his feet. He was almost playing Tig with Miraz now, keeping him out of range, shifting his ground, making the enemy work. Coward, booed the telemarines. Why don't you stand up to him? Don't you like it, eh? Thought you'd come to fight, not dance. Yeah! Oh, I do hope he won't listen to them, said Caspian. Not he, said Edmund. You don't know him. Oh! For Moraz had got in a blow at last on Peter's helmet. Peter staggered, slipped sideways, and fell on one knee. The roar of the telemarines rose like the noise of the sea. Now, Moraz, they yelled. Now, quick, quick, kill him! But indeed, there was no need to egg the usurper on. He was on top of Peter already. Edmund bit his lips till the blood came as the sword flashed down on Peter. It looked as if it would slash off his head. Thank heavens, it had glanced down his right shoulder. The dwarf wrought mail was sound and did not break. Great Scott, cried Edmund. He's up again. Peter, go it, Peter. I couldn't see what happened, said the doctor. How did he do it? Grab Miraz's arm as it came down, said Trumpkin, dancing with delight. There's a man for you, uses his enemy's arm as a ladder. The High King, the High King, up old Narnia. Look, said Truffle Hunter, Miraz is angry. It is good. They were certainly at it, hammer and tongs now. Such a fury of blows that it seemed impossible for either not to be killed. As the excitement grew, the shouting almost died away. The spectators were holding their breath. It was most horrible and most magnificent. A great shout rose from the old Narnians. Miraz was down, not struck by Peter, but face downward, having tripped on a tussock. Peter stepped back, waiting for him to rise. Oh, bother, 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 said Edmund to himself. Need he be as gentlemanly as that? I suppose he must. Comes of being a knight and a high king. I suppose it is what Aslan would like. But that brute will be up again in a minute, and then... But... That brute never rose. The Lords Glozel and Sopespian had their own plans already. As soon as they saw their king down, they leaped into the list, crying, Treachery! Treachery! The Narnian traitor has stabbed him in the back while he lay helpless. Two arms! Two arms, Telemar! Peter hardly understood what was happening. He saw two big men running toward him with drawn swords. Then the third Telemarine had leaped over the ropes on his left. To arms, Narnians! Treachery! Peter shouted. If all three had set upon him at once, he would never have spoken again. But Glozel stopped to stab his own king dead where he lay. That's for your insult this morning, he whispered as the blade went home. Peter swung to face of Pespian, slashed his legs from under him, and with the back cut of the same stroke, walloped off his head. Edmund was now at his side crying, Narnia! Narnia! The lion! The whole telemarine army was rushing toward them. But now the giant was stamping forward, stooping low and swinging his club. The centaurs charged, twang, twang behind, and hiss, hiss overhead came the archery of dwarves. Trumpkin was fighting at his left. Full battle was joined. Come back, Reaper Cheap, you little ass, shouted Peter. You'll only be killed. This is no place for mice. But the ridiculous little creatures were dancing in and out among the feet of both armies, jabbing with their swords. Many a telemarine warrior that day felt his foot suddenly pierced as if by a dozen skewers, hopped on one leg, cursing the pain, 
and fell as often as not. If he fell, the mice finished him off. If he did not, someone else did. But almost before the old Narnians were really warm to their work, they found the enemy giving way. Tough-looking warriors turned white, gazed in terror, not on the old Narnians, but on something behind them, and then flung down their weapons, shrieking, The wood! The wood! The end of the world! But soon neither their cries nor the sound of weapons could be heard anymore, for both were drowned in the ocean-like roar of the awakened trees as they plunged through the ranks of Peter's army and then on in pursuit of the telemarines. Have you ever stood at the edge of a great wood on a high ridge when a wild southwestern broke over it in full fury on an autumn evening? Imagine that sound, and then imagine that wood, instead of being fixed to one place, was rushing at you and was no longer trees, but huge people, still like trees because their long arms waved like branches and their heads tossed and leaves fell around them in showers. It was like that for the telemarines. It was a little alarming, even for the Narnians. In a few minutes, all Miraz's followers were running down to the great river in the hope of crossing the bridge to the town of Baruna, and there defending themselves behind ramparts and closed gates. They reached the river, but there was no bridge. It had disappeared since yesterday. Then utter panic and horror fell upon them, and they all surrendered. But what had happened to the bridge? Early that morning, after a few hours sleep, the girls had wakened to see Aslan standing over them and to hear his voice saying, We will make a holiday. They rubbed their eyes and looked around them. The trees had all gone, but could still be seen moving away toward Aslan's howl in a dark mass. Bacchus and the Maenads, his fierce madcap girls, and Salinas were still with them. Lucy, fully rested, jumped up. Everyone was awake. Everyone was laughing. Flutes were playing. Symbols clashing. Animals, not talking animals, were crowded in upon them from every direction. What is it, Aslan? said Lucy, her eyes dancing and her feet wanting to dance. Come, children, he said. Ride on my back again today. Oh, lovely, cried Lucy. And both girls climbed onto the warm golden back as they had done no one knows how many years ago. Then the whole party moved off. Aslan leading, Bacchus and his maenads leaping, rushing, and turning somersaults, the beasts frisking round them, and Salinas and his donkey bringing up the rear. They turned a little to the right, raced down a steep hill, and found the long bridge of Baruna in front of them. Before they had begun to cross it, however, up out of the water came a great wet bearded head, larger than a man's, crowned with rushes. It looked at Aslan, and out of its mouth a deep voice came. Hail, Lord, it said, loose my chains. Who on earth is that? whispered Susan. I think it's the river god, but hush, said Lucy. Bacchus, said Aslan, deliver him from his chains. That means the bridge, I expect, thought Lucy. And so it did. Bacchus and his people splashed forward into the shallow water and a minute later, the most curious things began happening. Great strong trunks of ivy came curling up all the piers of the bridge, growing as quickly as fire grows, wrapping the stones round, splitting, breaking, separating them. The walls of the bridge turned into hedges gay with hawthorn for a moment and then disappeared as the whole thing with a rush and a rumble collapsed into the swirling water. With much splashing, screaming, and laughter, the revelers waded or swam or danced across the ford. Hurrah, it's the Fort of Barona again, cried the girls, and up the bank on the far side and into town. And I think we're going to pause here and continue with this chapter in the next video. Till then, thank you so much for listening. I love you guys. Sticker says ta-ta for now.